Happy Mother's Day, people of hope. If we haven't met before, as my son said, I am Pastor Ashley, and I am the lead pastor here. Thank you to everybody whose child was a part of that video. I loved all the adorable answers. I'm not sure what my son said. I would be a turtle, and I'm really slow. I'm going to have to ask him about that after church. <laughs> Thank you to all the moms for who you are and all that you do. Come on. We love you and we honor you. If you're here today and maybe you've lost your mom recently, man, we're so glad you're here. God wants to speak to you while you're in this place. If you're here today and you don't have a good relationship with your mom, we're glad you're here. If you're here today and you've had a miscarriage and you're longing to be a mom, we're glad you're here. Jesus knows exactly what you're going through and he wants to meet you right where you're at. Come on. If you're a mom or you know a mom, you know moms like to talk about their labor and delivery stories. I don't know why, it's just something that we like to do. And I'm going to tell you mine, but don't worry, I'm going to spare you all the details. So when I first became a mom, it was with my daughter, Sophie, she's now seven. Um, and my pregnancy was so easy. I remember the day that I was going into labor, my husband and I were at home. And we were watching the Dan Patrick show on TV. He was rubbing my back while we watched Dan Patrick. And around noon, I was like, as the show ended and he got to finish watching his show, I'm like, I think we should go to the hospital now because I think I'm going to have this baby. And my husband's like, I think I'm going to get a shower now. <laughs> like, you waited all morning to get a shower? No, no, no. If you get a shower right now, we're having this baby at home. So he's like, never mind. Let's go to the hospital. And my labor with Soph was so easy. Afterwards, I was like, wow, I don't know why everybody keeps saying it hurts. It didn't even hurt. And then Ryder came along. And he was a different story. So with my pregnancy with Ryder, I had gestational diabetes. So my husband, Jay, would um, shoot insulin into my hip at all my meals. And when I went into labor, I had back labor, which is very painful if you've had that before. I'm sorry. I remember thinking... This might be how I meet Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, you know, with Soph, I had no drugs. With this one, I was like, please give me all the drugs. I think I might be dying. And they're like, well, it's, it's too far along in your process. We can only give you fentanyl. So they gave me that. And I remember thinking, why do people do drugs? This just makes me feel dizzy. It still hurts. <laughs> but of course, Ryder came along, and I was totally fine. And I got a new appreciation for all the moms with a tough labor. But having kids changed my identity. It changed me into a mom. I was not a mom, and then I became a mom. In the same way, when you know Jesus, he changes your identity from someone who didn't know Jesus, come on, to having a relationship with him, to being who God created you to be. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. We are in a series called Next Level You. This is all about how your life goes to the next level when you trust in Jesus. Before you trust in Jesus, you're disconnected from your purpose. You're disconnected from the love of God, from a relationship that he wants to have with you. But when you connect to Jesus, man, you discover so much more that's always been within you. You discover that you have a father who loves you, who has so many good plans for you, and he helps you become who you've always been created to be. Come on. He takes your life to the next level. Revelation 19, 16 talks about Jesus. It says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings, and Lord of, Lord, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. Written on his robe, so on his clothes, and on his thigh. He's got a tattoo on his thigh. Everybody who has a tattoo said, Amen. <laughs> He's the King of Kings, King above everything else. He's the one we were worshiping this morning. We worship your majesty because you're the King above all kings, the name above every other name. And at his name, everyone else bows. He's the king of kings. Who are the other kings? So he's the ultimate king. All authority comes from him. King of kings. We're the kings. Revelation 1, 5 through 6 says, To Jesus who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood 
and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Come on, because he loved us, when we believe in Jesus, his blood covers everything that kept us separated from God. It covers the places that we've missed the mark, and it restores us to God's original intent. Because of Jesus, we are royalty. He's made us kings. King Jesus' heart, it beats in your heart. His blood runs through your veins, and his spirit is one with your spirit. Today's message is called royalty. Tell the person next to you, you are royal. Come on. When God looks at you, he sees a king. He sees a queen. Point one today is that you are royalty with authority. You are royalty with authority. Come on. From the very beginning, God created us in his image to rule on the earth. We'll look at it in Genesis 1, 26. It says, God said, let us make mankind in our image. This is God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. So God created mankind in his own image. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God said, let's make mankind in our likeness. That's exciting. We are made in God's image. When you look around, you're seeing God's image on the earth. He says, let's create them to rule over the earth and have dominion, to rule and to reign. Adam was a king, not because of anything that he did, but because that's who God created him to be. It was God's original intent. He didn't have to earn his position. He didn't have to interview to be king or work hard to prove himself. All he had to do was believe who God said he was and live according to that identity. And it's the same for us. Before you did a single thing, God loved you and he had a plan for your life. You're not royalty because of what you do. You're royalty because it's who God says you are. So God gave Adam the whole earth to rule and he brings animals to Adam and he has Adam name them. Adam's like, that long neck one, that's a giraffe. God's like, cool, that's a giraffe. That chubby one, that's a hippo. Cool, that's a hippo. He brought all of them to Adam, and those are their names because a king's words carry power. And what he says goes. God does not name the animals because the earth is Adam's domain. Psalm 1, 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. God gave the earth to us. That's so cool. I think that's why as children, especially little girls, we love to dress up like princesses because we know deep down inside, we're royalty. Little boys, they love to dress up like princes and you know, fight with swords and pretend they are royalty because they know, we know we're destined to reign. Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were confident, they were secure, they had peace, they had God's blessing and his favor, he walked with them. And then one day, they stopped believing who God said they were. And they believed a lie that God was holding out on them. They ate the fruit of the tree that God had told them not to eat. And he told them not to eat it to protect them. He said if they eat it, they would die. So they ate it, and when they did, they were afraid. They ran and hid. They felt shame. And death came into the world. Adam gave away his authority. He gave away his kingly rights to the enemy. We know this because of what the devil said when he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world when Jesus walked the earth. It says, Luke 4, 6, the enemy says, all their authority and splendor has been given to me. So Adam had authority, he gave it away. And the enemy said to Jesus, if you worship me as king, I'll give it to you. But unlike Adam and Eve, Jesus didn't believe the enemy's lies. He was being tested in the desert and he replied to every lie with the truth of God's word. Jesus said, it's written, you should worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And at the cross, Jesus defeated the enemy 
and he took back the authority that was lost. Come on. Before he ascended to heaven, he said to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. That means the enemy has zero authority. You know, people get afraid of the enemy and they think he's some big opponent and there's this battle between God and Satan. The enemy has no authority. It's all been taken away. Jesus has all the authority and he gives us our authority back. Come on. Luke 10, 19, he says, I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. You have authority to overcome all all the power of the enemy because of Jesus. Nothing has a right to harm you. It's a promise. That means anything that doesn't line up with God's word in your life is subject to change. Even if you don't feel like it, you are authority. You are royalty with authority to build people up. No matter what other people say about you, you are royalty with authority to heal. No matter how you look, you are royalty with authority to set people free. No matter what you've done, you are royalty with authority. That's who God says you are. <laughs> Psalm 8.4 says, you've made mankind a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. He crowned us with glory and honor. Our crown represents our authority. God's the king and he crowns us. Authority comes from him. He says, we are rulers over the works of his hands, over the earth. And he says, everything is under our feet. God gave the earth to us, and everything is under our feet. You know, people say, he's got the whole world in his hands. But it's inaccurate, because he gave the world to us. He's given authority to you. We should say, we've got the whole world in our hands. That's what God says about us. He says, everything is under your feet. Darkness is defeated and Jesus already won. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live in poverty. You are royalty. When you know who you are, you know what to do. I think about the Queen of England. When she walks into a room, she knows who she is. She walks with strength, confidence, and dignity. She's not worried about what people think of her. There's probably people in the rooms that are smarter than her. There's probably people who are prettier than her, people who are more educated, people who are wealthier. But she doesn't think about them. She knows who she is. And when she wakes up in the morning, if she has thoughts of, oh man, I'm, I'm not this or I'm not that, she pushes them away, she puts on her crown, and she says, I am royalty. She operates in the authority of her kingdom. Revelation 3.11 says, hold fast to what you already have so that no one may rob you of your crown. The same way the enemy came against Adam and Eve with lies, the same way he tempted Jesus in the desert, it's the same predictable pattern that he tries to use on us. He says things to you like, you're not attractive enough or smart enough, or brave enough, or you don't have enough resources, or you've made too many mistakes. But we can respond to those lies with the word of God, with our authority. We can hold fast to who God says we are. Oh, yeah. So if he says you're not attractive enough, you just say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God works are wonderful. How well I know it. Come on. If he says you're not smart enough, you say, I have the mind of Jesus. If he says, you're not brave enough, you say, with my God, I can crush an army and scale any wall. If he says, you're not resourced enough, you remember, whatever I touch will be blessed. Come on. If he says, oh, but you've made mistakes, you just tell him there is therefore no condemnation in Jesus. Come on. Cling to what Jesus has told you so nobody can rob you of your crown. The enemy can only steal your crown if you give it to him just like Adam in the garden. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you resist him, by speaking the truth back to him, he literally runs away. 
ah, I can't bug this person today. They know their royalty. He's at a severe disadvantage, and he knows it. All he has is fear and lies, and the only way his lies have power is if you give them power because you have authority. When you agree with his lies, you give them power. But you have all the authority, and he has none. The only power he has is what you give him, so don't give him any. We don't have to give him anything. Can you imagine somebody trying to steal Prince William's crown? Steal his place as a prince? No way. The Queen of England crowned him. He has royal blood. You can't take his crown away. He can only surrender it, like Prince Harry did. It can't be taken. And if you surrender it, there's good news, because if you've believed lies, if you've lived in less than, you can pick your crown back up. If you've been settling for less than you've been created for, if you're discouraged because of a divorce or a disappointment or a death or a mistake or a financial loss, pick up your crown. Put it back on and remember who you are. I'm so excited. Today we have mugs for all of the moms when they leave after the experience. We'll put up on the screen for you. It says, you are destined to reign in life. And it has a crown to remind you every day of who you are. When you get up in the morning and you drink your coffee or your tea or your water, remember who you are. You are royalty. Come on. When you get in agreement with what God says about you, he empowers you. He frees you from lies and your faith grows. He transforms you from the inside out. Romans 5.17 says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So under Adam, death reigned. He gave away his authority. But because of the grace of Jesus, we've been born again to reign in life. Not just in eternity, but right now. The Bible says we reign in life. Point two today is that you are destined to rule and reign in life because of Jesus. You're destined to rule and reign in life because of Jesus. To reign, in this verse it says to reign is like royalty. Reign over sin, reign over powers of darkness, reign over poverty, reign over depression, reign over every curse, every disease, every sickness, and every power of darkness in your life. Remember, everything's under your feet. You have authority over it by faith. You're a king created to reign every day. You're a queen created to be victorious and to rise to the next level, you. And because of Jesus, you are seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And this is a really cool thing. We learned it in week two of Next Level, you ambassador. If you weren't here for it, you should go back and check it out. But it's Ephesians 2, 6. It says, in our union with Christ Jesus, in our union with Christ Jesus, God raised us up with Jesus to rule with him in the heavenly world. So we reign in life and we rule in heaven. We're kings. That's who we are. And we rule and reign. That's what we were created to do. When you know who you are, you know what to do. When you trust in Jesus, you get adopted into God's family. You're a king, and as a king, you are a co-heir with Jesus. Romans 8:16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, we are God's children. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. The only way to have royal blood is to be born into a royal family. And when we trust in Jesus, we are born again into his family. Come on, we get the blood of Jesus. And the best way to learn how to act like royalty, to learn who we were created to be, it's to get to know our Father God. And as you get to know him, he helps you to become the person he made you to be. He adopts us as his children, and he makes us heirs to his inheritance. Everything that Jesus is entitled to, we're entitled to. He's already given us everything that we need to live a life of royalty according to his glorious riches. But some of us haven't yet tapped into what he's given us. He's deposited a grace overpayment into our accounts, but some of us have not made any withdrawals. Our inheritance is waiting for us. 
If you're still walking in anxiety or guilt or condemnation, those things are not your portion. You can have your kingly inheritance of joy, of love, of peace, of patience, and so much more because of Jesus. It's like the prodigal son settling for pig slop when he knew all his father's servants were so blessed in his father's house. You don't have to settle anymore. You're not a pauper, you're a prince. When you feel overwhelmed, remember, you're the son or daughter of the king. You're his children. You walk tall and you straighten your crown. When my mother passed away, my sister and I were co-heirs to everything that she had. We each received an equal share of her estate. When they gave us our checks, we weren't like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to cash that. I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy. No way. It's my birthright. That was my mother's estate. I received my inheritance. I'm the head and not the tail. Above only and never beneath. I am chosen. I'm a masterpiece. Come on. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm deeply loved, highly favored. That's my inheritance, and I will not forfeit it. I rule and reign in life because it's what I was created for. I will not be crushed by life. I crush the enemy under my heel. I want to speak these truths over ourselves. Ecclesiastes 8.4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Come on, king's words have power. Your words have power. You have authority. And the enemy can't say to you, what are you doing? Life and death are in the power of the tongue because you're made in God's image. Remember, we saw that at the beginning of today. We're made in his likeness. And God created everything in his image. He spoke it into existence. And when we speak, we speak things into existence. God backs up what we say with his power. People who don't know Jesus, they walk and talk a language of fear and insecurity because they don't know who they are yet. But the kings of the kingdom, they walk and talk like Jesus. Speak out in power. When people speak lies, speak truth. Where there's conflict, speak peace. Where there's division, bring unity. Where there's fear, you speak faith. Bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Come on. Adam lost his crown in the garden because he didn't speak. Eve said the fruit was good, and he stayed silent, even though he knew the truth of what God had said. Kings and queens cannot remain silent. They speak up when others are afraid. They protect and bless those around them, and they take ownership of other people's problems. We're a royal priesthood called to develop a culture at home, at church, at work, in our nation that brings out the best in people and helps them to become who they were created to be. The culture of heaven comes through our language and the words of our mouth, they overflow up out of our hearts. They overflow up out of what we believe. Point three today is that royal people train others to reign. Royal people train others to reign. When you know who you are, what comes out of you helps other people to reign. And it starts by thinking like royalty. When you know who you are, you see the value that God put in other people because you're not preoccupied with yourself. I love Moses. You know, as a baby, he was set on the Nile River in a basket. Pharaoh's daughter found him, and she raised him in the palace. And before he could let his people uh, be released from slavery, he had to grow up as a prince. He grew up with a kingly mentality. He grew up knowing who he was, knowing his authority, knowing what he was entitled to. If Moses has had a slavery mentality, he would not have been able to help other people get out of slavery. The first 40 years of Moses' life in the palace were where he learned his identity, and they were so important for him to be able to accomplish everything else God wanted to do through him in the rest of his life. Because when you know your royalty on the inside, you make a royal environment around you. If you believe lies, if you think you're a slave to sin, you'll produce an impoverished environment around you. When you believe internally who you are, that comes out externally. What you believe, you might think it doesn't matter, but it impacts everyone around you. 
Our identity comes from God, but it's first communicated through our parents. If you had a healthy family, you're more likely to know who you are. But some of us were raised to be seen and not heard. Some of us were raised where people said, you are not significant. You would not amount to anything. Those were lies. It's time for you to be born again into who God says you are. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. As royalty, we get to train our children to reign. Moms, raise your sons to be princes. Build them up with your words. Speak into their future so they don't have to try to prove their identity when they grow up. Dads, take your daughters out. Show them what it's like to be a princess, to be valued, and to have fun while you treat them respectfully. If you don't have children, train those around you to reign. See the people, the potential in the people around you. Solomon was born a king. He probably never struggled with rejection or neglect or abuse. His whole life, everybody told him, you are destined to reign. You are royalty. You will rule one day. What would it look like if we raised our children to know that they are kings in Jesus? It's not too late for them. And it's not too late for you if no one has done that for you. Or maybe you were treated like a prince or a princess your whole life. Maybe you treat your kids like that right now. Teach them to help others who come into their presence feel valued. We're not kings and queens so that we can live a self-centered life. Teach them to use their power for good. When you know who you are, you can help others know who they are. The best kings and, king, kings and queens of the world, they know they have power and authority for other people, to serve people around them. They're like Jesus. He did not come to be served, but to serve. The powerful use their power to help the powerless. When you know who you are, you're freed up to raise up people around you rather than worrying about yourself. When you know who you are on the inside, you can be selfless and give away more than you receive. You don't have a poverty mentality because you know your father's a king and that makes you live differently. You walk and talk and act like the royalty that you are and you help other people to straighten their crowns. I read a story about Helen of Troy and she was a queen. And one day she was kidnapped, she was carried off to another nation. She bumped her head and she had amnesia. So for many, many years, she was missing. And someone from her hometown came to find her. And they saw this woman sitting by the water. Man, she was bruised and beat up. Her hair was all matted. She was barely talking. And they saw some markings on her hand. And they said, Helen, you're Helen of Troy. She said, who? You're Helen, you're a queen. And she remembered who she was. We want to be the people who help others rediscover their true identity, rediscover who God says they are, who they've been created to be. We're going to look at Matthew 28 one more time. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And here's what he says to us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us all authority to go make disciples to remind people of who God created them to be, to reconcile them to God, and to restore their original identity. You were born into royalty, created to rule and reign. You are crowned with honor and glory. You're a child of God. You're a co-heir with Jesus. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. Don't settle for anything less than the life of a king. Don't surrender your crown, except to lay it down at the feet of Jesus when you get to heaven. If you're in a fog right now, like Queen Helen of Troy, if you have strongholds that have held you back, they're being broken off in Jesus' name. You have authority over anything that's trying to hold you back. Our words have power, 